Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Dan and I am the collection development librarian at Newton Public Library. And uh, this is a high of a different form of books and beans. So hopefully we'll be able to do that next year um, in person and not be uh, on Zoom anymore. Um, but tonight we'll have uh, four guests and they're going to share some books that uh, they think are great and that you might find interesting. And then uh, we'll have some time at the end for questions. And if everyone's OK at the end, I can turn everybody's cameras and stuff on and they can actually talk to us if everyone is OK with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll just do a couple of quick announcements here really quick. Um, so um, next, the 29th, we'll have two story times at 930 and 1030 for ages 1 to 5. Um, and then on Wednesday next week, which, or no, sorry, then Thursday next week, which is July 1st, we'll have our other story time, which is um, the uh, five to nine year olds. And that is also a 9.30 to and a 10.30 uh, book discussion as well. And then just as a reminder, we will be closed on July 5th, which is the day after the 4th of July. So don't come to the library that day because we won't be able to get you any books. <laughs> so get them on, on Saturday the 3rd instead. <laughs> um, and um, we will, I will see you does, uh, Melissa, do you have any announcements from Heston? Yes, um, we are in the middle of our summer reading program. Wednesday mornings is our birth to five um, story time. So Wednesday mornings at 9.30. Thursday afternoons at 3.30 is our elementary school group, and Friday afternoons at 3.30 is our middle school group. We have Tanganyika visiting the library on the 14th. Um, everybody's invited for that. I think we're going to actually have it at Newton High, or at Heston High School, because um, we're collaborating with Mound Ridge Public Library on that. Um, so check that out on our website. Um, all of our information is there. We're also closed on the 5th of July, so don't come to Heston Public Library on the 5th of July either, because we won't be there as well. <laughs> um, Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. Uh, so our first uh, person up tonight is our uh, is the director of the Newton Public Library, Dr. Carrie Cusick, and she will be telling us some of her favorite books to read. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? First question, right? Okay. So Dan basically said the theme was potpourri and I could talk about whatever I wanted, which is dangerous. And I feel like my pile is really substantial over here. So since I was a kid, I've been really drawn to nonfiction books, always have been. So that list is a little longer. And you know, in the last few years, I've really been drawn to books about social topics, which are not always the brightest and cheeriest and happiest of books. But I have found for me, the act of, you know, reading a book, it keeps me from like instantly arguing with the person or doing the rebuttal, like a well written book on a social topic, I think is a good sort of antidote to, I just read the headline and I tell you what I think. And so the first couple are kind of social issue oriented, which Again, I think it's just a good exercise for us to consider other viewpoints. So first one is The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in an Age of Colorblindness, Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander, written several years ago. I read it several years ago and talks about how her argument is that imprisonment and the way that criminals are treated subsequently after they have spent time in jail is essentially the modern day version of slavery. So again, not a pleasant book. It is a well-researched book. It's very dense. And you know, I've lived my whole life in small town Kansas. So this was an issue I had not even really considered, but, um, and some of the things she talks about like civil forfeiture, I had never even heard of. And now the Supreme Court has kind of made some decisions and clarity on that. Um, but I think just a really eye-opening book. And again, as these issues about policing and you know, justice with the criminal justice system, I, I think any book that is as, as well-researched as this is worth reading. So first, lovely cheery read. 
Second one, I've been meaning to read for years. It came out in 2017. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI by David Graham. And uh, like I said, I've been meaning to read it. People told me how good it was. And when I started here, everybody, Dan, Andrea, they're all like, oh, it's so good. Um, it reads, it's set in Pawhuska, Oklahoma, that area in the 1920s. It starts off very narrative, reads like a good sort of murder mystery, but it is nonfiction. And ties it into the larger issues of Native American exploitation at that time and the oil money that was in Oklahoma and you know it was it was given to the Osage Indians and other tribes but essentially the government created policies that allowed them to be taken advantage of and not have act, true access to their money and um, they are, I believe, making a movie. I think they've already started filming it so I expect that it will get a little bit more interest. <laughs> but uh, just a really, and it ties it into those larger issues. I was glad when I read that because it's kind of a micro, you know, this particular incident and these murders and ties it into the larger issues. I had previously read, this is probably the least cheery of all of my books, An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And we actually have, the young adult version here in the library. I have not read it, but this is definitely not a young adult um, version of a book. But this is sort of the macro take on the US government's policies toward Native Americans for the history of the United States. Um, the type of book that sticks with you, not pleasant to read. And in one that I think tend to maybe be defensive and want to argue with, but Again, well-researched um, and an important book. So slightly less dark is Dakota, A Spiritual Geography by Kathleen Norris. Kathleen Norris, I was assigned this book my first semester in college and I hated it, absolutely hated it. Kathleen Norris is a poet and her writing is very poetical. It's very uh, literary. And I had not read anything like this. And I didn't know what to do with it. I've since reread it a couple of times. And even though I've never lived somewhere as sparse as the Dakotas, she talks about moving from New York City to her grandmother's house in the Dakotas and sort of the implications of what that does for her faith and her sense of self. And it's just beautifully written. She's written a couple others that I've read. We have a cloister walk I know here and just beautiful writing and thought provoking, but almost reads like a fiction book at the same time. So just beautiful writing. And the last one is much lighthearted, um, but very practical. This is one that sticks with me. These are all kind of books that have stuck with me. This one is called Cozy Minimalist Home by Mike Quillen Smith. I am, my husband and I have moved more than I ever intended to move in my life. And I am terrible at all things, decorating, homemaker y all that. I'm awful. No sense of style. We'll just say that. And this book, the tagline is more style, less stuff. And it's really about kind of approaching our homes and our spaces and getting the foundational elements right. She talks about how it's easy to go, like try to fill our homes with stuff that matches our style instead of kind of figuring out what we like and then making sure the big pieces in our home are right and kind of building off of that. And when I find a space in my house or something I don't like, the lessons from this book come back to me. So it's just a really, it's it's beautifully laid out. It's It's pleasant to read and just, just a nice relaxing you don't want anything serious like the rest of my pile um this is just kind of a fun way to rethink about our spaces and our homes okay fiction my fiction choices are probably oh i almost forgot my most i almost forgot so i almost forgot because Brene brown is my probably i would almost say my favorite nonfiction writer and I went to pull a Brene Brown book for tonight and every single one we have in the library was checked out. I consider that a very good sign that the people in Newton and surrounding communities have excellent taste, excellent taste. But most of them, hint, hint, are available 
through Libby, downloadable ebook and audio form. So this is my favorite of hers, which is Braving the Wilderness. And it's called The Quest for True Belonging and the Courage to Stand Alone. What stuck with me out of this book was she talks a lot about dehumanizing language and how our language is not neutral and the way that as a society we talk to and about one another is not a neutral act and it has real consequences for people. And that was a very thought provoking part of that book. But all of Brene Brown's books are great. Her Dare to Lead, I think is her newest. It's a book about leadership. And I think it's still on Netflix. There's a great Netflix special that she did that even my husband thought was amazing. So one of my favorite, favorite authors. Okay, now to fiction, my short fictions. You've probably heard of every fiction book I have. I only have three. Um, Again, my, my taste in fiction is maybe a little trite and cliche, but Still Life is the first book in, by Louise Penny in, and I'm probably mispronouncing this, the Armand Gamache mystery series. I'm probably butchering that. And I probably butcher every name in these books in my head. It's set in Canada in a fictional town called Three Pines. So I love cozy mysteries. One of the ones I loved was the Hannah Swenson series by Joanna Fluke, but after a while I stopped reading them because I'd pick it up, I would open up the flap and I couldn't remember if I read it because the plots are so formulaic that they all sound the same after a while. Louise Penny is the cozy mystery writer that does not do that. Her, it's still, it's not gruesome. There's no, I can still sleep at night, but her characters are well-developed. You want to move to Three Pines and hang out with everybody in this book. The plots are, are nuanced, there's complexity. There's a couple of books in this series that I read in a day because I could not put them down. Um, a favorite series and just a great cozy mystery. Her writing is, I would say a notch above any other cozy mystery writer that I've ever read. So Still Life is the first. Yes, start at the beginning, do not be a heathen. Do not start in the middle of the series. Okay, Still Life. Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. Eleanor Oliphant is, she is so human. This book is, is so character driven. She is this human and you love her because she's flawed and she makes terrible choices and you wanna scream at her, but you want good things for her because you just love her. And it's, it's dark, but hilarious at the same time. I don't know how Gail Honeyman does that. Um, just just a captivating book uh, about kind of the depression and the loneliness that she feels and, and kind of coming out of that and coming alive. So it's kind of triumphant in the end, but a great, great novel. And I, I would say I've never wanted a sequel to a book more. I don't believe she's coming out with a sequel because I want to know what happens to her because you're rooting so hard for her by the end of the book. Love it. Last one, very cliche, I don't even care. Pride and Prejudice, this is my favorite book to reread. I love this book. And if you were like me and you try to read this book and you get really lost because there's so many characters and they all talk funny, then the solution as I learned, and I never say this, is get the BBC miniseries, not, ah, did I go away? My camera died. Hello? You can still hear me, but you can't see me, right? Yeah, I well, can. I can hear you okay my camera died well i'm almost done get the bbc miniseries not the kiera knightley one the characters are all wrong get the full bbc miniseries <laughs> watch it and then when you read the book you can keep track of the characters in your brain i am constantly amazed every time i reread pride and prejudice how witty and clever and relatable the characters are even today uh, one time I even ILL'd an annotated version that gives you all sorts of context and talks about the history and everything. It's great. Just that's my, my favorite to reread. If you've never read it, do it. That's, that's all I have. And I am going to be terribly rude and duck out of here in a couple of minutes because it's my daughter's last t-ball game of the season. <laughs> so I apologize, but great, great to hang out with you. Hope you found a good book. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Um, and I will have to agree that Still Life is super, such a great book series, your book, first book in a series that makes you want to keep reading them after you finish the first one. Um, and I think next up is, is Becky, 
also known as Melissa. <laughs> uh, and um, I'll let uh, Becky introduce what book she's reading um, next. All right. Okay. Um, I have to give you a little background. Uh, I always love to read, but I also am a quilter and a gardener, uh, grandkids. And so reading was always one of those things that I just kind of put off to the last. And so it never got done. So um, being the member of the board of trustees for Heston Public Library and a avid member of the Arboretum, I found out through Melissa and some of the other members on, on our, our uh, club is we were starting a nature's book club that brought those two things together. And so I go, okay, Becky, this is your time to um, increase your reading. I, I do love to read, but now I know I have to read. And so that's okay. It's not like it's not like a due day. I mean, yes, we do have due dates, but it's it's one of those things I push everything aside because I've got to do some reading. So it worked out really well for me. We've been going since we first met January of 2020, <laughs> met at the Arboretum. Um, we're a very small group. Uh, actually, right now we only have four. Uh, so if you're all interested in after I talk about this a little bit, we'd be more than happy to have you join us. We have not done our uh, most recent read yet. In fact, I'm going to be talking about one of the books. Um, we've, we are meeting four times a year. And because it's a nature's book club, we're doing a fiction and a nonfiction. And there is something connected with hum humanity and how we interact with our world in nature. And so um, there, has been, there has been some of those books that we've read that it was like, I would never have picked that one up. I, in, I got a lot out of it. I don't think I'll ever read it again, but it exposed me to something that I would not have necessarily read. So, um, so yeah, I'm gonna go and tell you about four books. Two of them are fiction and two of them are nonfiction. Uh, the first few, I think it may have been the first time we met, um, we um, read Braiding Sweetwater, or Sweetgrass, sorry, by Robin Wall Kimmer, uh, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. And um, to be quite honest, I listened to this one because I couldn't get the book. <laughs> I go, I got to get this done. So I'm, I, I can also quilt and listen at the book at the same time. But um, the author, she's a, she's a trained botanist, botanist. And um, so she has lots of questions about nature. But the twist is that she's also a member of the Citizens Potawatomi Nation. So she has the indigenous um, training growing up. And so she embraces both of those, of course, as a botanist, you have to embrace plants, but embraces those, the knowledge of the plants and animal life and our connection with that. And, you know, I've, I've always thought myself as being uh, ecologically correct. And, but when you really start reading her, her book, it begins to say, you know, I need to be I need to be a little more spiritual, perhaps, with um, my connection with the book or with the, with our with our nature. Um, she brings those two lenses of knowledge, both the botanist and her in her indigenous background, kind of together, and creates a little more of a consciousness to the reader um, to have a little re uh, reciprocal arrangement between man and nature. Um, it is pretty deep. I, I have to say, um, uh, because of the, the botanist background, she does quite a bit of scientific stuff, uh, talks about scientific stuff, but um, it, it was a good book. And I've heard many people say it was well worth going through. So uh, that's one. Um, <laughs> gonna change a little bit. Okay, so my background, I grew up in Southwest Kansas. 
And that is where the center of the Dust Bowl were, was. And I had read both of these books, well, at least well, both of the books I'm going to talk about, one's a fiction, one's nonfiction. Um, my great grandfather homesteaded in 1885 in Stanton County. It's just the county one up from the corner, of, which is Morton. I'd heard all kinds of stories. Um, my grandmother hated the area. <laughs> they left when my mom was 16 to go back to the uh, Eastern Kansas in 1936. Um, but my mom had a younger brother who had asthma. <laughs> it was probably good that they left. But the book is called The Worst Hard Time. And it's written by T uh, Timothy Egan, uh, the untold story of those who survived the great American Dust Bowl. Um, I have to say, even growing up in this area, and, and it's this story, not story, this book is really centered more in the Dalhart, uh, Texas area. Instead of Kansas, it does talk a little bit about liberal and whatever. Um, it, it's, it's a hard read, <laughs> I have to say this. Very interesting for me because I know the area, but these people were brave or crazy or, or whatever. And this great grandfather of mine lived through it. He died in 1939. Um, I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they did it. Um, but it's, it, it's a, a um, understanding of what these people went through um, what the government was um, encouraging people to move out there and plow that that um, uh, grassland. <laughs> I had a great aunt, Aunt Bell would say, maybe we shouldn't have. And she grew up, I mean, she was born in right about 1900. And I always took offense because I, I still have farmland out there. That's That was our, our living out there. But I think maybe she was probably right. Um, it, it goes through a lot of the history of this, um, starting in the 1920s. Um, it also has the government side, the the FD, uh, the Franklin Roosevelt, and what he did in reaction or worked with. Um, didn't realize that some of our con con conservation programs actually started back then. Only makes sense. Um, it does go through the area of, of uh, southern Nebraska. So that part of that story is in here and the people that survived. It, it, is, it is a good read, it's a hard read, but I think if you're at all interested in history, especially of Kansas, and Kansas has um, some fabulous history. And this is one that you might not have thought about, just a side note, and I didn't realize this until my husband was doing some research. So. The Ogallala Aquifer, that is where the water, it's a very deep water, very uh, pure water that we irrigate a lot out of in Western Kansas. If you lay that over where the Dust Bowl was, it's almost exact. And I think it's ironic, here these people, I mean, they were starving to death because they didn't have anything to eat because they hadn't grown anything. Animals were eating, um, uh, uh, tumbleweeds that came with the Russian wheat, uh, just try to try to stay uh, stay alive. They pickled, they pickled uh, tumbleweed. There wasn't anything else. And so, uh, but anyway, you might find this to be interesting. So I won't say anything more about that. Um, on the same theme of uh, the Dust Bowl, and these were two books that I had suggested our group read. And that's kind of how we come about these books. Um, there's two, two people in our group that are very intellectual. And so it forces us to, to maybe read some things we might not always read. But this one, when my sister gave to me, and she lives out in Liberal right now, and she said, it's an owl on every post by Sonora Babb. And it's actually a reprint from a 1970 copyright. Um, you would say, well, this really isn't fiction. It's a memoir of her growing up in uh, Baca County, Colorado. And if you don't know where that is, it's the very southeast corner of Colorado. 
and uh, very similar. I, were we, what were we, 20 miles away? No, 30 miles away maybe from uh, Two Buttes is actually where she was growing up. 19, oh, mm, it's the very beginning of the 1900s. She and her mother, she, sister and mother, came out to meet their dad who had, had come out to uh, buy property out there because his father had encouraged him. This is gonna be a big moneymaker. It's, it's a paradise out here. <laughs> I think he had some rose colored glasses because it's a beginning of the 1920s and into, into the uh, a very dry time. Um, She's, she lives in a one room dugout, not even a sod house. It's a dugout in the ground. When she looks out the window, which I was surprised they even had a window, she could just see the eye level. Her eye level was the ground. And so she became uh, acquainted with all kinds of varmints and insects. She was uh, seven when she got there. She had a little sister. Her, mo <laughs> Her mother did not grow up. She grew up in the uh, Oklahoma, um green tree area and uh, the father who was already out there said just just bring yourself just bring yourself well she didn't really want to come very well she knew it might be hard and <laughs> she brought her piano with her on the on the train and uh, so that's kind of a it's a kind of a a theme that runs a little bit through that uh, her life and how she was able to uh live through this. Um, but it, it, it's a really, I, I really found it interesting. I've now read it twice. And um, you, you might, I think you might enjoy this one. It's, it's a fiction, but yet it's a memoir of this um, young lady who uh, uh, learned to love. She absolutely loved the, the country. She had a wonderful collect, connection with her grandfather who had suggested they come out there. Um, learned to read <laughs> from the newspapers that were on the dugout walls, um, fighting um, a rat that got into the dugout. And I mean, there's all kinds of things. I won't tell you anything more because I want you to read and find out the information. And the last one, we just, uh, just finished reading this one, well, I just finished reading this one. It's called The Seed Keeper. It was one of the best books I have read in a long time. Um, and, I, and I can't go too through it a lot because I don't want you to ruin, the, ruin it for you. Um, but, um, and I think I'm just gonna kind of highlight some of the, the information that I found on, online about it. So Rosalie Ironwing, and this is back with the indigenous people, indigenous background people. Uh, she grew up in the woods with her father and her father was a high school science teacher, Indian as well. And um, mother had died early. And so she learned all about the plants and stars and the origin of the Dakota people. This is happen happening in, I believe was South Dakota. Um, Till one, more, one morning, her dad didn't come back home from checking his traps. And so she didn't have any family. She was all by herself. So she was uh, taken and went to live with a foster family in Mankato. Um, she was very reserved. Granted, you would be. Growing up, being different, um, so she meets, while she's in foster care, she meets this very rebellious young lady named uh, Gabby Makes Peace. And this, this, this friendship is strong enough to last for decades that they haven't seen each other. Um, so she's living her life. Um, one winter uh, day, many years later after she, uh, uh, is, is old enough to get out of foster care. Uh, she returns to her childhood home that her dad had never come back to, it's still there, but she was a widow and a mother, mother of a 20 year old. So he wasn't around. 
And so she um, she's grieving from the loss of her husband. Her husband was a farmer <laughs> and was a Caucasian. So she had that, um, that struggle, not necessarily between him and her, but between her and society around her. Um, the, the Caucasian um, Europeans that are still there, they remember huge battles that there were many lost. And so they look upon uh, Rose, Rosalie Ironwing as a perhaps a, an enemy. And so she really has to fight through this, but she finds solace in her garden and um, some seeds that were found in the house uh, when she married married this uh, uh, European, and uh, really found peace, raised her child this way, uh, so that he knew his background. And um, so there's a drought that happens, and there's also a chemical plant that comes in. And so um, she's she's got a lot to work through. Um, can't tell you much more. You really need to read the story. It, it is it's an excellent one. So uh, I think that's it. How did I do for a non-reader? <laughs> oh, you were fantastic. Thank you uh, for joining us. I forgot to mention at the beginning that um, everyone who joined us tonight, so if you're on Facebook, uh, send me a comment or or like a send the library a private message or uh, make a comment and um, we will um, get you entered into a drawing and I got some cool prizes that I left at the library but I have like a coffee mug with the library's logo on it and a tales and tales bag and a book light and so we'll select someone at random um, and give you a call or an email and you can come pick them up at the library. Uh, so um, keep that in mind. And um, for those people watching on Facebook, in case you miss it, we'll have some time to ask people questions about the books here toward the end of our time this evening. Um, but next up is uh, Kathy uh, Anderson, who will be sharing uh, some great books as well. Okay, so like Becky, I'm a member of the Board of Trustees, but for the Newton Public Library. and. Um, I was trying to think uh, what to talk about for books. I have five uh, fiction and nonfiction. And one of the things that occurred to me is maybe to talk about, oh, getting over pandemic brain, you know, just being at home and, and what helps you kind of move forward. Um, so here are, here are those things that I was thinking of. This book, is called The School of Essential Ingredients by Erica Bauermeister. And it's about a woman who gives cooking lessons in her restaurant. And it's about the people who find their way to those cooking classes. Each chapter gives a backstory for one of the characters in addition to moving the plot forward. And um, I heard about it from a friend who said, oh, I've been reading this book and the language is so beautiful. Um, she said she was limiting herself to one chapter per night. She just wanted to savor the language and um, the atmosphere uh, of the book. Well, I just gobbled it up. I didn't savor nothing. And, um, and then, and good news, there's a sequel <laughs> called The Lost Art of Mixing, which I also enjoyed. So it gives a bit more story about several of the same characters from the first book. So if you like... Uh, talking about food or, or thinking about how food can affect um, our, our well-being and our self-perception, um, you know, there's some of that mixed up in here. So that's a good book. Um, a nonfiction book, and I see Becky did the same thing. I, I read this book uh, through Libby, so the library does not have a hard copy of this, um, but it's called How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell. And uh, this book is not about sitting around being a slug. 
Uh, it is about making conscious choices to resist what she calls the attention economy. So uh, basically what we have to give, whether we're rich or poor, we have attention to give. And uh, people are, the world is just bombarding us um, with messages to pay attention to this or pay attention to that. And it's pretty radical to say no. Uh, so if you ever have felt anxious that you're not doing enough um, or that you're paying too much attention to the wrong things, especially uh, in the digital world, online, um, social media, um, <laughs> this is a good book to read. It helps to revive your sense of observing and listening, uh, especially to the natural world. But it, I found that it was very much like um, having a conversation with a really interesting friend um, and there was no agenda and there was plenty of time to talk about whatever was being talked about. So I liked that, um, that aspect of the book, enjoyed reading that. Uh, the next book I have is uh, fiction and it's called The Coroner's Lunch by Colin Cotterell. And good news, it's a pretty long series. Yay, I like series. <laughs> and um, so, okay, I didn't know anything about the world uh, that this book was set in, which it's set in Laos, L-A-O-S, Laos, um, in the 1970s after the Communist Party has taken control of the country. Well, that was just never covered in any history I read. And, um, so the main character is a retired surgeon who's in his 70s, who's just been designated the country's first coroner, and he doesn't want to do it, uh, but there's no escaping the bureaucracy. So sorry, that's your job. And uh, his name is Dr. Siri Paiboon. Um, but fortunately, Dr. Siri is really good at manipulating the system and especially in the cause of justice and compassion uh, for victims, uh, including the people that are laid out on his um, examining table. Um, it's very funny uh, and snarky and sweet without sugarcoating the, the real problems of society and living at, the, at that time. Um, and lots of character development over time. I don't wanna to give too much away, but I will say that I just found out there had been a couple more written since I last checked into the series. Delighted to be reading uh, you know, the 10th or 11th book in the series. So plenty of character development and uh, interesting things that happen. So there's that. Okay, um, let's see, the next book that I thought of mentioning is called um, Homework by Julie Andrews. It's uh, her second memoir. The first book was called Home and was about her growing up as a child. And this is the book that she talks about um, her Hollywood years. So uh, making movies while she's raising a family. And I enjoyed uh, reading about the choices she made which she talks about pretty straightforwardly, but she doesn't try to make herself look perfect. Um, and so, you know, yes, I mean, maybe they had issues with the chalet in Switzerland or whatever. They also, they had plenty of problems, um, <laughs> but I mean, she's disciplined, she's hardworking, she's talented, she's a loving person, um, but her life was uh, pretty much as messy as anybody else's. And it's, it's quite interesting to read about a real person um, talented person, you know, how she gets through life as well. So um, plus all that background stuff, if you've ever thought you wanted to be a, um, a movie star, you might want to read this book and see what it's like behind the scenes. So I thought that was quite interesting. And then uh, the last kind of the last book I have is uh, nonfiction, and it's called Movement Matters by Katie Moman. And um, this book is not about exercising and why you're supposed to exercise, but it is entertaining, it's very easy to read, and it's very uh, deeply science-based uh, information, uh, a collection of discussions that, that help you think about human movement in a new way. So for example, uh, chewing stimulates your brain 
mm, I don't spend that much time thinking about chewing, but um, <laughs> you know, all the different ways that we move besides walking or biking or whatever. Um, so you can read this book in short chunks, which is quite nice. And you can just skim through and, and um, see what catches your eye. And she writes very, I like every book she's ever written. Um, so I will mention another book um, by Katie Bowman. The library doesn't have this yet, but the library needs to get this. Um, and it's called Dynamic Aging. And now this is a book about exercise. Okay. Um, it's written by Katie Bowman, but also uh, co-authors are four women who were in their 70s and, and early 80s when the book was written. And they talk about um, cha uh, implementing changes and how they moved, how they uh, do their daily lives and what the results were. So this is a mix of biography and it's got some exercises and some scientific explanation. Again, very entertaining and easy to read. Um, makes you think about moving and what you can do for yourself um, in a new way, which I, which was, I found um, very in, uh, interesting and intriguing. So those are the books that I had today. Thank you, Kathy. And our last presenter tonight is Melissa Carlson, the director at Heston. Thank you, Dan. Um, yes, I am the director at Heston Public Library. And I decided to focus on, well, when he said, just pick books you love, I'm like, I can do that. So I started picking books I love, and I'm like, they all have the same theme. I guess we're going with the themes presentation tonight. <laughs> so mine focused pretty much on historical fiction and a lot of medical historical fiction, it seems to be, that I like to read. Um, so the first one is probably, and most of them, maybe a lot of them are ones you've heard of already. Um, so the first one is the Outlander series, huge series, a thousand pages each. I consider it one of my greatest reading accomplishments as a reader to get through the whole series. New ones coming out, I think by the end of the year. I already have it on pre-order at the library. We're hoping it's coming. Um, so the next one in the series is coming. And then there's a lot of um, companion series and other uh, characters she's taken and written series about them as well, like the Lord John series. Um, set in, 19, in two settings, 1945 and 1743. What I love about it is it crosses all genres. There's, you've got the sci-fi time travel, you've got the romance, you've got the historical fiction, the mystery, the humor, and some war, war scenes. So it talks about um, a nurse in the 1950s who gets married, ends up falling through some stones back to the 1700s and meets a gentleman there. Now she was a nurse in the 1950s um, and her nursing skills kind of help her survive back in the 1700s um, where she is considered, um, she's actually accused of being a witch at one point because she knows a lot about herbal medicines and those kinds of things. Um, so she goes back in the 1700s, there's the war in Scotland happening, um, Culloden. Um, and so this takes you through it starts in like the 1743 time when she goes back in time, clear through 1777. So at the end of the series, you're getting close to the Revolutionary War. It's a long time period there. Um, I consider it, I'm going to rate all my books. I'm considering it rated R for violence because it is very violent. And there is a lot of adult content, um, some pretty intense scenes in there. Um, it is a movie series as well. You may have seen it. I have all the, I own all the DVDs as well um, in the series. <laughs> so, and my husband's watched all the DVDs as well. Um, but I love it because it just crosses all genres. And I just love that you get so many different um, characters. It's hard to keep track of them sometimes. Um, I've always liked Scottish and Ireland history. And so this just really fit for me. Um, you really get caught up in their time periods and learn more. So I've done some outside research um, just on the history of this. And um, so by Diana Gabaldon. And my next one is a newer one. Um, this is called Quintland Sisters. 
um, by Shelley Wood. And this is about um, the uh, some quintuplets that were born in Canada in 1934. And they um, were, oh my gosh, this, it takes, the point of view is written from a young girl Oh no, I think we may have lost Melissa for a minute here. Let's give her a chance to come back online. <laughs> Five kids. Am I still on, Dan? I think we lost you for a minute. Okay, where did you leave off with me? Um, at the very beginning of that book. Okay, are we back? Yeah. Okay. This is about the Quintlin sister. This is called Quintlin, Quintlin Sisters by Shelley Wood. And it is about um, these um, quintuplets that were born to a pretty poor family. They already had five kids and lived in a very small place. It's taken, the point of view is from a young girl who's um, probably 14, who's basically thrust into midwifery by her mother, said, you will be a midwife. And she goes on this call, her very first call with this seasoned midwife and quintuplets are born. And she pretty much lives in with these quintuplets the first five years of their life, just basically moves into the house and just is there with them all the time. 1934 is the setting in Ontario. These girls were big publicity during the time of the Great Depression. I mean, they had built a whole separate house for them across from their original house and people could tour and look at them just playing in the yard so you may have heard of some of these um or may have heard of this story um i like i tend to like this i rate i rate it pg-13 for a gra the graphic birth scene at the beginning and there's some abuse um in the family and just how the girls are kind of used for um, publicity and um, I like it because it's a medical oddity and it's history and it all kind of fits in with the genre that I enjoy. Um, it describes in detail with actual records. So there's actual newspaper articles in here um, from that time from the doctor's point of view and, and m many different points of view. So you get the actual research that goes along with it, but it is considered a fiction story. Quentin sisters. The next one I have is a nonfiction. It's the only nonfiction I have in my bunch and it's called House Calls and Hitching Posts. And um, this is a stories from Dr. Elton Lehman's career among the Amish. Um, it is set in the 1950s through 2003 is the latest date I can find in there. Um, it is rated PG for some graphic death scenes that he does um, uh, have to go on call to in the Amish community. Um, it follows his life, Dr. Elton Lehman, who was the doctor in the Amish community located in Eastern Ohio. Um, he did not actually write the story. He told his stories to um, Dorcas Sharp Hoover, who then recorded them and put them into a book. Um, he basically had this practice out of his house. The Amish did not want to visit hospitals. They preferred small country doctors and midwives, those kinds of things. They really trusted Dr. Lehman um, with their care and they would bring all types of very severe injuries to him and he would do, he would fix them up right there in house. Um, a lot of uh, very traumatic things. And he did, went on tons and tons and tons of house calls. Um, what else can I say about that? Uh, just a great nonfiction book. Um, it just, each chapter is a different story of a different patient that he took care of or a different family um, that he worked with. And he worked really closely with the midwives in the Amish community and helped with their, um, their births if they were having um, the ones that may be difficult and then ended up building a hospital in the same community eventually. And his son took over his practice at the end. So good nonfiction. Um, I have two more. This one's called Maggie's Maid um, by Marie Benedict. And this is set in 1863 in Philadelphia. Um, it tells the story of, it's a fiction story. 
based on the author had done some research. People have always wondered what changed Andrew Carnegie. He, at first, he was a very ruthless businessman, would stomp on anybody to get what he wanted, but something changed him um, at a certain point of his, in his life, and he became much more um, focused on educating the poor and just put all of his um, work into um, all of his work into helping others and they couldn't figure out what turned him. So this author took, sorry, my dog isn't enjoying this company too. <laughs> um, she took this and, and took it from the point of view of her, his mother's maid. And they think maybe one of the servants in the house was what changed his viewpoints. And so it's kind of a love story of his mother's lady's maid who comes into the house. It's a case of mistaken identity. She wasn't supposed to be there. She was, um, of, I, she was from Ireland. Her family sent her across the seas to make money so that they send it back to the family farm. And she pretended to be somebody else and ended up in the Carnegie's house and became the lady maid, the lady's maid for his mother and then developed a very deep connection with him. And that, so she took, the author took the liberty to kind of make this story of this was the woman who changed the way he thought and how he learned to help other people in his life. So it was an excellent read, Carnegie's Maid. And the last one, I'm not a rereader. I do not like to reread books. I pretty much read them once and I'm done. This is one I've read probably 60 times because I taught and I read it every year. It is a junior book, the only junior book we've had tonight, um, Harris and Me by Gary Paulson. Um, he wrote Hatchet as well. So if you have really worth that series, it's a very um, popular um, junior series. This is his memoir, loosely based memoir. Um, it is about actual people in Gary Paulson's life. He did go live with his cousin, Harris, a distant cousin for one summer. He was a city kid who grew up in a really rough home, parents who were drunk most of the time. Um, so he got shuffled off to many, many different families growing up. And one summer he lands at his cousin Harris's farm. Never been to a farm before. This book is laugh out loud funny. These boys get into so much trouble on this farm all kinds of trouble with chickens and pigs and trying to learn to fly and electric fences and it is he gets a lesson i think we lost melissa again we will be right back, everybody. The agent okay. just takes you back to the old days. And that's what I love about it. So sorry, Dan, if we didn't catch all that. So it looks like my internet's going in and out. That's it, all it I have. It, it happens. I have had multiple internet <laughs> issues before, so it's OK. Um, um, Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, the people in Zoom, or not Zoom, we're all in Zoom. The the attendees in uh, in the Zoom meeting, um, let me know if you have any questions, and I can turn your um, cameras on so you can you can ask them yourselves instead of typing them if you'd like, or if you'd want to share any of your favorite books. <laughs> and same with the people watching on Facebook Live. I know. If not, we will call it an evening. And Kathy, I will make sure that book gets gets purchased <laughs> <laughs> for the library. It sounds very interesting. So. Oh yeah, it, it's a good read for anybody who's old or who wants to be old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good connection to be on a board, correct? <laughs> so 
Well, thank you everybody and um, uh, for joining us. And I look forward to seeing uh, all of you at the library tomorrow to check out all these books that we talked about tonight. Oh, um, Dan, I had a question. Will you uh -huh. have a, a list of the many books? I was writing down some of them, yeah. but I, I'm not sure I got them all. I believe I have everybody's lists in, in you know, two or three different messages. And so I will see if we can get a nice fancy handout made and then we can, uh, I'll email everybody and um, we will get that out um, for everyone to look at, so. I, my books are different than my list. I'll send you an email, so. Okay, perfect. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and thank you all for coming. I, it was very fun. And I always like hearing about what everybody else is reading, so. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.